Thank you so much for giving me a chance to speak with you and share some of my experiences. What I'm gonna share with you today may surprise you, but I know we can move things forward in the right direction if we start from a place of transparency. My background and training in medicine, public health, and health disparities has made me passionate about today's talk. The medical profession may be doing harm to patients and communities. Many years ago, as a first year medical student, I took an oath, like thousands of physicians before me and thousands of physicians after me, that I would first do no harm to the patients and the communities that I serve. And since then, I have committed my career to taking care of patients and underserved communities, just like the one where I care for patients now at Ohio State University's CarePoint East on the near east side of Columbus, Ohio. But over time, I've seen that the medical profession has broken that social contract with underserved communities that we serve because of racism and placism. Now, this is going to be best illustrated if I walk you through the lives of two of my dear friends. So first, let me tell you who they are. Many years ago, as a young, newly minted physician, new to practice, I started my career off in Central Connecticut, where I had the good fortune of meeting two wonderful women who would become lifelong friends and honestly, like family. And it is through their lenses that I will walk you through the impact of racism and placism in medicine. So first, I want you to meet Wendy. Wendy's a black woman. I met Wendy as a middle-aged mother, hardworking woman, worked so hard to provide for her family. Through my relationship with Wendy, I've learned so much about tenacity, grit, and honesty. I also want you to meet Sarah. Sarah's a white woman. I also met her as a middle-aged woman, also a mother, hardworking. Sarah did so much to provide for her family as well. And through my friendship with Sarah, I learned so much about allyship and loyalty. Now, when I met Wendy and Sarah, they lived about six miles apart in central Connecticut. Sarah lived in the wealthier suburbs outside of West Hartford and Wendy in the inner city outside of East Hartford. Although they only lived six miles apart, their potential interactions with the healthcare system could not have been any more different because of those two important things, racism and placism. So let's talk about what those mean and what those look like in medicine. I will start with racism. So racism in medicine means that Wendy, as a black woman, would be much less likely to have positive interactions with the healthcare system much less likely to be taken seriously by doctors, and much less likely to have state-of-the-art healthcare where she lived. Because in medical school, we are taught that black patients have a higher threshold for pain. If Wendy came to my office presenting with pain, as a black woman, she would be significantly less likely to have that pain addressed. Similarly, if Wendy, as a black woman, presented to the emergency department with crushing chest pain, she would be significantly less likely to receive any life-saving intervention for a heart attack. Now, in medicine, nursing, and other health professions, we're often taught to discount and discredit the symptoms of black women. So if Wendy, as a black woman, were pregnant, she would be three to four times as likely to die in that pregnancy or in childbirth than Sarah would as a white woman. Similarly, if Wendy gave birth to a baby, as a black woman, she'd be twice as likely to bury her baby before the age of one than Sarah would as a white woman. And if Wendy's black baby was taken care of by a white physician, that baby would even have a higher risk of dying in that first year than if it were cared for by a black physician. Racism in medicine also means that although Wendy as a black woman would be much less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer or colon cancer, if she were diagnosed, she would be diagnosed at a later stage with much more advanced disease and have a 50% higher mortality than Sarah as a white woman. Additionally, it's not the phenotype of race, but the structures of racism that will lead Wendy to toxic accumulation of stress. And this stress will make her a victim of earlier heart disease than Sarah. So racism has taken its toll in medicine and it is present right here in Columbus, Ohio. Now the other issue is placism. And by placism, I mean the ignorance of or lack of attention to the importance of a person's place, where they live, their zip code on their health. We know that 80% of a person's health status is determined by social determinants of health not their interaction with me as a doctor. These social determinants, the conditions where people live, work, play, school, and age are critical to their health. These include things like housing, economic security, jobs, safety, violence, food security, transportation, and more. But chances are your doctor has looked at you and made a decision on how they will or won't care for you based on your race, 
but they have never paid attention to your place or your zip code. So this shows up in significant health disparities in life expectancy based on your zip code. If you look at the state of Ohio, in green, you'll see wealthier parts of the state where people have a life expectancy into their late 80s, almost into their 90s. Not too far from some of these same zip codes, in red, you see that people have a life expectancy in their 60s. So there can be a 29 year difference in your life expectancy based on your zip code. Now if we zoom in on where I am right now in central Ohio, where OSU has such a large footprint, the life expectancy challenges are the same. You can see places that are not that far away that have over 27 years of a difference in life expectancy between the poor and the wealthier zip codes, like Dublin and Franklinton. Where I currently see my patients, on the near east side of Columbus, Ohio, a mile away from that clinic in the wealthier suburb of Bexley, people are expected to live 18 years longer than the people in the community that I serve in. This is not just an Ohio problem. Chances are no matter where you are in the United States, these same health disparities exist. These disparities based on your place exist. So back to Wendy and Sarah. When I met Wendy and Sarah, they lived about six miles apart in central Connecticut. But that meant that Sarah was expected to live to the age of 84 and Wendy to the age of 68, a 16 year difference based on six miles. So you may wonder, what if we just moved Wendy over to where Sarah lived? Will that change her life expectancy? Unfortunately, because racism would follow her, Wendy's life expectancy would not change. It would be as if Wendy had lived in the same place for her whole life. And that is because racism is the father of placism. Placism is a derivative of racism. Systemic housing discrimination and segregation, redlining, and many other structural factors have led to the reasons why people in certain communities have lower life expectancies. How then can I have lifelong friendships with both Wendy and Sarah? I want us to all live and have our relationships until we're in our 80s. And this is where I believe we can make a difference through changes in education and leveraging technology. So first, with education, I believe that we need to dismantle and deconstruct racist, oppressive, prejudicial, biased education that we provide to medical students, nursing students, and other health professional students. The same mythology and stereotypes that were used to justify slavery are still taught in medicine today. So we need to dismantle and deconstruct that sort of education and instead replace it with anti-racist, anti-oppressive, scientifically focused, stereotype-free, and informed care that allows us to give equitable care to our patients. I am pleased to say that we've already started some massive curricular form at OSU's College of Medicine through partnerships with our College of Medicine leadership, our faculty, and most importantly, our students. This is a work in progress right now. But it's not just education that we need to address. We know that educational reform takes a long time. So what do we do about the thousands and thousands of physicians, physicians like me, who are not going back to school anytime soon, but have been unfortunately indoctrinated with these awful stereotypes and beliefs about their patients? This is where I believe the second solution, technology, can help us. I believe that we can leverage technology to help us be anti-racist and anti-placist. So what might this look like? Chances are, if you go to a doctor's office, they are using an electronic medical record where they're collecting so much information about you. And I believe that we can use clinical decision algorithms that will allow us to be anti-racist and anti-placist at the point of taking care of you as a patient. This is because most doctors have looked and acted based on your race, but they have not asked about your place. So what would that look like in real life? Let's say a patient, we'll call her Molly, came to my office. And in the course of care, which is customary, my medical assistant, before I even see Molly, would document Molly's height, her weight, her blood pressure, and ask her about her pain on a scale of zero to 10. Zero would be no pain at all, and 10 would be her worst pain ever. What if Molly had reported that she had a seven out of 10 pain, but as often happens to black patients, I didn't pay attention to it? What if the technology could call that pain to my attention and stop me before I could do anything else in that electronic health record and say, studies tell us that black women are much less likely to have their pain addressed. Are you sure you do not want to address Molly's pain? So I could choose, yes, I'm sure, I do not want to address her pain, I want to be racist, or I could go back and do something different. Similarly, what if I was not managing her high blood pressure with top of the line agents? We know that black patients often get third or fourth line agents for their hypertension. What if the technology stopped me here too, 
and forced me to be anti-racist, reminding me that African-American patients are much less likely to get prescribed first-line agents, and asking me, are you sure you do not want to change Molly's medication? I could say, yes, I'm sure. I want to continue to be racist, or I could go back and do something different, or at least document why I made the decision that I made. The same thing could apply to colon cancer screening. What if I didn't screen Molly for colon cancer, which is what often happens to black patients? The system could also ask me about that too, remind me of the disparities with black patients and force that into my consciousness. It could force me to do no harm. Now, could we apply this to placism as well? As I mentioned, chances are that doctors have not paid attention to your zip code, nor would we know what to do if we saw it. So what if we use community mapping tools, health equity indices, and other geospatial imaging technology to share more with us about the social determinants of health, not only your risk based on your zip code, but what to do about it right at the point of care? What if the technology called out my patient's zip code and told me the problems that she would face based on the zip code and that she was likely to die early from heart disease? And the system could ask me, will you discuss heart health and disease prevention with your patient? I could say, no, I want to continue to be placist, or I could go back and I could do something different. I believe that we can do this. I believe that we can turn the tide and renew that social contract between medicine and patients. But it's going to take patients, institutions, and doctors to all play a role. And I have suggestions for each of these groups. I believe that patients should feel more empowered to ask more from their doctors. As a patient, you have a right to full health. Ask us to address your pain. Ask us what screenings you should be having based on your age or your gender. Ask us if we are really giving you the first line medications for your condition. My team at our Ohio State University Center for Primary Care Innovation and Transformation is working on technology to assist in this right now. We are developing a virtual reality enabled solution creating patient-centered and patient-inspired applications and educational tools that can empower patients to address racist and placist experiences. This technology will also guide doctors and other clinicians to confront their own biases in practice. I am excited that we are doing this in partnership with our community engagement team and a minority tech collective based right here in Columbus. But educational institutions, you also have a role. We need you to retrain your doctors, your nurses, your health professionals. Deconstruct and reconstruct that educational model that you have. Teach physicians, nurses, health professionals to see patients as whole people. Teach them to be humble, culturally empathetic, and to see the patients that they take care of in the context of their full self. Model better care. Create learning experiences that allow your learners to deeply engage with the communities that they take care of. In fact, you could probably replace some of the clinical experiences in hospital settings with some quality community-based time for students to better understand the lived experiences of underserved communities. Our PACT program, Partners Achieving Community Transformation, OSU's community engagement nonprofit, is working with our Health Equity Steering Committee on strategies to do just this. And finally, the third group, our doctors, my peers, my colleagues. We took an oath. We promised our patients and society that we would take care of them, that we would do no harm. Honor your oath and honor that social contract. Give patients the love and the care that they need. See them as your parents, as your siblings, as your children, as your aunts, your uncles, your cousins. Care for them as you would a relation. See beyond their race, but understand their place. Be committed to humility and transparency and acknowledge where you fall short. Confront your biases. Our virtual reality tools for eliminating implicit biases and racism will help you too. I know that we can do it. If we all play our role, we can give life, love, hope, and healing to the communities that we serve, and together we can do no harm. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and go Bucks. <laughs>